Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Discovering Multifamily podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And boy, do we have a special episode here today. A little bit different, but I, I think it's pretty important. We talk a lot about achieving financial independence, um, financial freedom, and what that means to you as an individual, whether that's spending more time with your family or you know taking you know vacations that you you, you would you wouldn't take on your own time and not being a slave to a nine to five by you know investing in yourself and your future personally, professionally, and and obviously financially. And Luke's trying to solve a problem from a very young age. Uh, Luke is a serial tech entrepreneur in the first place. He bootstrapped and sold his last company. Um, and he's a philanthropist and uh, he's, he's an expert in software development and he's written tons of books and he's a great speaker. He's got four awesome kids and an amazing wife. And uh, he's coming at us from uh, California, sunny California. And his um, uh, new company is trying to disrupt financial literacy education um, at the very young age at the classroom level and by helping students use uh, what's called participatory budgeting to invest real money by starting out into their schools. So when they become older, um, they can learn how to invest their money wiser and uh, you know, uh, contribute uh, to society so uh, in a better way. So we're really excited to have Luke on the show, and uh, thanks for coming on, Luke. Thanks for having me, Anthony. I'm really uh, glad to be here. And I, I picked up a couple of things that you said right off the bat, which are so critical to everyone, this notion of financial independence, financial freedom, e and even defining it as, hey, I might want to take a vacation. And maybe that's special for people right now because our vacation lives were so disrupted by the pandemic. And just this notion of how do we get back to normal? How do we have a sense and feeling of normal? And how does that relate to finances is pretty critical. I 100% agree. Uh, so talk to us about what, what you're trying to solve, what problem you're seeing on the ground. Are you seeing it in, in California? What made you think of this idea? And uh, we'd love to hear that. Sure. Let's take a step back. My background is in building solutions for enterprises to help them manage portfolio investments. So you have a pot of money and a big company. You have an annual budgeting process and you're in a company trying to make those investments and you're a small business owner and you have a partner and you're trying to do that in your own company. And you do that by talking. I know for a fact that you probably spend a lot of time talking with your partner on, well, what are the right investments for our company and how should we make those investments? Well, I took those insights and I built a software platform in my last company that enabled large global enterprises to collaboratively determine how to make investment decisions. It's a little easier in smaller companies. It might be you and your partner, maybe two or three other people, but imagine your BMW or your Salesforce or your Cisco, you might have 60 people in five locations in multiple time zones who really should be associated with making that investment decision on how to manage a, a multi-million dollar or multi-billion dollar portfolio. We built that software using a technique known as participatory budgeting in which groups of people come together and they make decisions. Philanthropically, I started to do the same technique with cities and schools and I got hooked because what I saw was when we brought participatory budgeting into schools, and we supported students with making decisions about real money. They realized that real money isn't a game. It's not a simulation. It's not a like a Sim City. It's it's actual real money. And they started to learn the core foundation of financial budgeting, financial decision making, and uh, they had a new relationship with the concept of what does it mean to be a citizen and civic engagement. And I'll pause for a second and then we can describe the process because I because that was a lot right there to start with. No, I think it's great. So the next question would be is how, you know, obviously, you know, when you're a child, you're exposed to, um, you know, to finances uh, in many different ways and not all one size fits all. So I'm, I'm curious to understand where you, what, what level, what age level you think is appropriate for them to um, basically have, 
you know, to have a say in where their money gets allocated or, you know, um, whether it's their money or they're aggregating their yeah. um, community's money or school's money. Um, yeah, the what, research shows that um, uh, the research shows that the first financial event in a human's life is around the age two, which is a call to purchase request. And so when you think about it, Anthony, the, the, what's really interesting about financial literacy is that it's a life skill. And what I mean by a life skill is that it involves both technical knowledge, like what is an investment? It, in, it involves a skill, like how do I compare to investments? And it involves a disposition. How do I feel about that investment or what is important to me? And so life skills are started the moment you're born into a family unit, whatever family unit you have. And there's lots of different family structures. And what I want to distinguish for people is you can compare a life skill from a technical skill. Like think about chemistry or biology or algebra. Those are just technical skills. We can pick those up in school, but a life skill starts the moment I'm born into that family. And so the question that you asked is, well, at what age should a child have a say? Well, okay, of course at age two or three or four, they're too young cognitively to, to be involved. But what we have found in our program of participatory budgeting is that we can start in elementary school around third grade to get the kids involved in this process. And I've mentioned it as a process. So let me briefly explain. When we talk about in giving kids money to manage and using that technique is we're not just walking up to the kids and saying, here's some money, good luck. That's not appropriate. What we actually do is there's a software platform and an integrated curriculum for teachers, which guides the students through five distinct phases. Phase one is creating a theme, like do I want to work on uh, education uh, initiatives or do I wanna make the school environment better or get more athletic equipment? Phase two is create ideas. And it's kind of the fun phase. I'm just creating ideas. Like a kid might say, we, we need more band equipment. Well, no one can do anything with the idea of band equipment, but it might be interesting to some other students so that goes into phase three. Phase three is refinement, where groups of students work on refining the idea into something that could actually be acted on. So some kid says, hey, I wanna get some new band equipment. Well, what does that mean? I want two guitars, one electric, one acoustic. We're gonna buy them at Amazon. They're gonna cost this much. The band uh, director approved the guitars, et cetera, et cetera. Phase four is voting, where the students create those proposals, they compare it against the budget that they've been given, and they vote. And this is a really important financial step, because unlike the federal government, every successful business, every successful home, every successful city and school has a limited budget. And we all have more ideas than we can spend. So part of the, I know you're smiling right now, so for people listening, Anthony has got a big old smile because he knows it's true. We know it's all true, right? We all have more ideas. You know, ask anyone who's ever gone through a home improvement. First, they had more ideas than they can afford. And second, they went over budget anyway, right? So, so we always have this desire. And I think it's an important part of financial literacy to genuinely teach our kids, hey, look, you have to make choices. Except in participatory budgeting, we make those choices as a community. The last stage is in many ways the most exciting phase because the kids see their choices actually implemented in the school. Uh, we had one fifth grade class in Madison, Wisconsin get soccer nets and trees and uh, not to be denied fidget toys for the classroom. And then they got to see all of those items coming in to the school. They saw a tree planted. They saw soccer nets for their, uh, uh, for their gym equipment. We've had kids buy books for libraries and paint murals and buy 3D printers and buy chemistry equipment, things that they know they need. Uh, and it's, it's, it's genuinely very exciting. So we think it's around, a, uh, around um, second, third grade that it starts. 
And then it carries forward all the way through a high school at different levels, different amounts of money, uh, different levels of or kinds of impact, but it carries through every step of the way. Very interesting. So when you're um, talking about giving children, like you said, uh, you know, the age levels that you're, you're speaking about, uh, buying equipment and books and other things, what, you know, obviously I smile because you mentioned, unlike the federal government, you know, we have unlimited, uh, or we have, everybody has a budget. So is there a specific budget that you recommend or that you, you allocate? I'm not sure how your process works. I'd love to hear how it works. Um, sure. To, for the students um, to learn. And, and so you, there's, together. yeah, there's two questions there, right? Which is how much money and where does it come from? So let's start with how much money. What we find is uh, the amount of money is somewhere between $2,000 and $10,000. And it's a number that is, and I'll kind of explain the number in the following way. We want the number to be big enough to be meaningful to the kids but not so big that adults are going to take over. So if I walked up to an elementary school and I said, hey, you've got $2,000 and it's the fifth grade classrooms, that's, the adults are going to be like, yeah, they can do something, but it's going to be okay. And you can imagine in a high school, that number would be higher, maybe $10,000. We've actually seen high schools go as high as $50,000. But when you think about a high school of maybe uh, 2,000 kids, that doesn't seem completely outrageous, right? I mean, if I walked up and said, hey, the, the kids in the school are gonna control $2 million, then the adults, not that they should, but they would probably get nervous. Um, and they, they shouldn't because the kids are demonstrate that they make great choices, but they might. Uh, the second is where does this money come from? Right? Well, you know, we're always talking about where does money come from? Well, there's three sources of funding. The first is every principal has discretionary funds in their budget. Uh, and those discretionary funds have increased by billions of dollars in the CARES Act, which was recently passed by Congress through something called ESSER or ESSER funding. And so there's, there's a tremendous amount of money right now that principals have been given by Congress to improve social emotional learning and help people um, uh, recover from the pandemic, help the schools recover from the pandemic, which is pretty cool. The second area of funding is in PTAs or education foundations. So we're doing a, a, a project right now in Sunnyvale where the Sunnyvale Education Foundation is sponsoring the initiative. The third is in philanthropic organizations or corporate social responsibility programs. An example here would be Rotary International, which is a well-known global institution of really wonderful people who are sponsoring civic engagement and education. So they're sponsoring schools and even corporate employers. For example, uh, many, many companies have matching contributions to employees. So Salesforce and Qualcomm and Cisco and Intel, all these really big companies, uh, Microsoft, they have these matching programs uh, where if an employee makes a donation to a school, the company will match it. And that creates the funds necessary for the participatory budgeting program. Got it. And so why do you think um, this participatory budgeting is not in place across the country right now? Why do you think this is kind of been overlooked um, and how long has it been overlooked? Yeah, I think it's been overlooked partly because it's not an American invention and Americans tend to uh, be more interested in what Americans in invent. So the history of participatory budgeting is that it started in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 1989. And it's when those residents in that city were really fed up with corruption. They were paying taxes and you know, imagine you're, you're paying your taxes and we all grumble about our roads and our water and whatever, but imagine you're really in a very poor city and you're like, how come things are just never getting better? So they used participatory budgeting as a way to create transparency in the budgeting process. So it started in Latin America, it expanded throughout Latin America, it moved over into Europe and I am among the people who started bringing it into corporations, 
and started to be among the first to use it in America. And we started doing participatory budgeting programs in the city of San Jose, California, America's 10th largest city. We would assemble hundreds of citizens in person and online to make decisions about the city budget. And I did this work for free, Anthony. I was building my last company, so I had a good job. Uh, of course, I was self-employed like you, right? So it's kind of like you, 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 you have a good boss, it's yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and you pay yourself your fair rage, right? But I had a company and I decided that I wanted to do this philanthropically. And that was really great. And that's when I fell into doing it with schools. My, I have four kids, as you mentioned, and one of my kids was in a middle school. So we started doing it as an experiment in the middle school. And I just got hooked when I saw how the conversations at dinner changed, how the, uh, the, 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 the interactions with my children started changing because it was about real money. And there's this... Um, technique in education that's called, or, or a description of a technique called project-based learning. And the idea is rather than giving kids a traditional problem, like a word problem in a textbook, you give them a project that they care about. And because they care about, the teacher then uses that project as the way to teach concepts. And in participatory budgeting, I mean, imagine the difference. Uh, you walk into school and, and you're in ninth grade and you get some kind of a stupid word problem where you're in sixth grade and it says, uh, Satish and Billy are going to the store to buy apples. They have $20, apples cost $149 a pound. How many pounds of apples they, can they get? And the kids are like, come on, you gotta be kidding me. And instead, you walk up to the kids and say, hey, you've got $2,000 to make your school better. What are your ideas to make the school better? And Satish is on an, a sport, a sports person. He's like, hey, we need new, uh, you know, we need new baseball bats. And Billy is, is more an artist. He's like, no, no, we need more art supplies for the classroom. Well, now they have ideas. Well, how much art supplies? Is there a way that we could both be happy? with the budget? How do we talk? How do we work about, uh, how do we work out our issues and our differences? And we need to do that every day of our lives. If, if you're married, you have to work out where to go on vacation with your wife. You mentioned uh, at the beginning in our intro, financial independence, financial freedom, taking a vacation. I actually include my kids in our vacation planning. And uh, we believe this so strongly, Anthony, that we've created a version of our software that's free for families. It's the First Root Family Edition. And what you can do with the Family Edition is go through a participatory budgeting program with your family. The, the, um, for my family, I think of my wife and I as the CEOs of the household. So we set the budget for our family vacation but then we get the kids involved and where do we go? If we were to say, go to Hawaii from California, well, now I can teach financial literacy concepts like, well, there's an overhead cost called plane tickets. If I stay in California, I don't have to pay the overhead of the plane and I could use the same amount of money for more activities. So, so that's the kind of conversations. Another example of a financial concept that's really important to teach is total cost of ownership. And you know that is in your work at, in real estate, you don't buy a building and then not include other costs necessary to renovate it. You're, you're, when you're making your financial decision, you're looking at the total cost of ownership. You're factoring in additional items to improve the building so that you can create the kind of inv investment that you're known for. So you know as well as anyone that it's not the cost of the building, it's more. When we are working with kids and families, we have the same thing. When, when my kids say, hey, dad, let's go to Disney. Here's the cost of the tickets. Well, I turn around and say, okay, but it's not the cost of the tickets, is it? We've got to add food. 
We probably all want to get a souvenir. I think t-shirts are cool. So I want to get a t-shirt. You might want to get a toy. That's cool. I'm not saying no, but I'm saying we need to budget for it. We need to budget the total cost. So by working with this concept and engaging the kids and having a platform, we can really transform that, that conversation and that interaction. I think it's, it's excellent. And, and I love how mission driven you are in, in this venture. Uh, how can uh, my audience find more about you and more about your, your venture? What's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, it's pretty easy to find me on LinkedIn, uh, Luke Homan, so L-U-K-E-H-O-H-M-A-N-N. And then our website is firstroot.co. And we have a ton of uh, educational material, supporting material. You can see solutions for schools and districts and families. You can see educational videos, download uh, content that would be helpful. And it's just growing. We're a we're a pretty fast growing startup and it's kind of a fun place to be. So uh, we, we definitely encourage people to get on board because we think participatory budgeting is going to be pretty big. Excellent. Well, we love it. Uh, thanks for coming on, Luke. If you liked what you heard and or saw today, if you can please give us a rating and review on iTunes, we would really appreciate it. That's how Luke and myself get our message out to a greater audience. That's the way iTunes works. And it, we will also include a link to the website for Luke and his LinkedIn in our social media descriptions to make it easier for you to learn more about him and his platform and what he's trying to do. So really appreciate you coming on, Luke. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.